The Lord be with you. Tonight, our theme is Seeking Mercy for Our Neglect of Others. We'll be dealing with the Ninth and Tenth Commands, and I've chosen one particular hymn to help underline where we find mercy for our neglect of other people. It's called, O Dearest Jesus, What Law Hast Thou Broken?, Although it's 15 verses long, and so for us to be able to sing this well tonight, I've divided it into three. So our opening is going to be the first five, our sermon hymn will be the middle five, and then our closing will be the concluding five verses. And we are recognizing that our Lord Jesus was faithful in order to bear the those things that we are unable to do adequately. Our opening, we begin now with 439. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stand. 
stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. Joyous light of glory. Heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with your voices forever. Oh, Son of God, O oh, giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Bless we the Lord. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. Our first reading comes from Romans chapter 13. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. As we prepare to hear the gospel reading, we sing, Go to Dark Gethsemane, hymn 436. Jesus Christ to pray. 
Follow to the judgment hall, view the Lord of life arraigned. Wormwood and the gall, all the pangs sustain. Shun not suffering, shame, or loss. Learn from him to bear the cross. Calvary's mournful mountain flood, there adoring at his feet. That miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete. It is finished. Hear him cry, learn from Jesus Christ to die. Hasten to the tomb where they laid his breathless clay. All is solitude and gloom who has taken him away. Christ is risen, he meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to rise. We stand for the gospel, the holy gospel, according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve. And with him, a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching. and You did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. 
We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He was delivered up to death, delivered for the sins of the people. You may be seated for verses 6 through 10. gave this command, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting is about desiring things that other people have out of envy. Coveting is about collecting and keeping for oneself. Coveting is willfully not looking at the needs of others, especially those whom you dislike. These ninth and tenth commands expose you as one who cares for your own needs first, and it reveals that you are easily persuaded to wash your hands of responsibility for meeting the needs of those who you don't want to help. In this first part of the sermon, we're going to see why we get it so wrong when we think that we do a reasonable job of being charitable towards others. Let me start by saying that you don't have an accurate view of yourself, and what you think about your own good deeds is flawed. 
The most accurate thing that can be said of you is that you are inconsistent. You are very poor at obeying God's commands. You're selfish and you're defensive when you're told the truth. Now before you raise your hand and begin justifying yourself, let me remind you that you're never going to have a chance to point out the good deeds, the ones that you mentally keep track of because it's a source of pride for you. You will never have the opportunity to show this to God in order to explain that you were a fairly decent person on this earth compared to others. Whatever things that you have done for others don't count for anything. They don't indicate that you've been a good person. There is no record at all of what you've done. Your good works are not credited to you. So now that I have spoken the law so that it appears like a mirror and you can accurately see yourself, your best response is to confess there's a lot of truth in that. The Lord does not think of you as being good-natured like you describe yourself as being good-natured. You're born to the sin of Adam and your nature is entirely corrupt. Don't miss this. This is a classic Christian confession to say that your nature is completely immersed in the sin nature that is inherited through Adam. There is no light in you whatsoever. Everything about you will perish. Your body, your work, your time here, it all goes unrecorded because of sin. And that is the way it is for all of us. God's word solemnly tells the truth through the prophet David. There is no one who does good, not one. God's word solemnly tells the truth through the apostle Paul who says, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. And God's word solemnly tells the truth through Jesus himself, who looks his hearers in the eye and says, no one is good. It's from this humiliating place that we say, Lord, have mercy. I tell you the truth, and if you seek mercy, there is from the one who is capable of giving it. There is a reason why we've been singing 15 verses of a hymn. And so that we can ask the question, why is Jesus bearing punishment for sins that we have committed? For things that have been lumped together in an inconsistent life. And we're here to ask the question, were my offenses so serious in God's eyes that he had to die for the stuff that I did and all the stuff that I didn't feel like doing? Is this a reasonable response from God for us being normal? Dear Jesus, we ask, what law have you broken? Because as you hang there, you appear very guilty. And your accusers mock you. And they say that you are horrible. That you are a sinner. And that you are helpless. Mary saw no sin in you though. Neither did Joseph. The angel made it clear to them that you were conceived by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the sin nature, that which comes from Adam, that's not you. 
not born of Adam's sinful seed, thus not born immersed in the curse as all of us are. So then, why is it necessary that he hang there derelict and still? The crucifixion is an historical event. And Jesus himself gave the reason for his upcoming murder. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And he was referring to his body as the temple. Jesus said, everything written about the Son of Man by the prophets must be accomplished. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He'll be mocked, shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. And Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. It was for you that Jesus gave himself as a spotless lamb for sacrifice. Though he had no sin, he became guilty of all sin. And that is for the world, the entire world, those who try to be righteous, and those who don't try to be righteous. Find yourself in those categories, and you recognize that he had to hang on the cross dead for your sake. Dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken that such sharp sentence should be spoken on thee? The master pays a debt that we owe And there, there he hangs in love. If you're going to find mercy, you're going to find forgiveness for the sins that you all have committed because of your own stubborn willfulness, this one, this Jesus, is the only one that you can ask. With the greater love, a phrase that we're taught by the Apostle John, He laid down his life so his friends could have a Savior who would be adequate to undo, pardon, and atone for that which they have done while in the sinful flesh. And this one, with the greater love, defends us from Satan, the very one who was strong enough to persuade Adam and Eve to say yes and leave paradise and enter into the sinful state. He's a defender from that. He's a savior from sin. And he is the one that goes into death, that empty place of punishment and abandonment by the Father. If you are looking for mercy, you need to look to the only one that's worthy of the name love. Greater love has no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his only son as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. It's because of him that all your serious offenses of disregarding your neighbors year after year, all the misguided things of what you've coveted from time to time, all those things are met in the adequacy of Jesus Christ, including the scorn and the contempt you have for other people in this world. We have to go to some place greater that holds the answer for us. Otherwise, we remain on the perimeter unreconciled with a God who is against our sin. So we turn to Jesus 
Whenever the mirror of the law is held up against us and we hear the truth of what we have thought about others. It's almost unbearable to hear. Listen to what Jesus says. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And here comes the rest of the verse. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Here again. If anyone with earthly possessions sees his brother in need, but withholds his compassion from him, how can the love of God abide in him? Hammer after hammer after hammer strike when we see what we have done and the offense we cause against God and our neighbor and our neglect of truly caring for others. Hear this. With the measure you use for others, so the same shall be used, measured out unto you. Lord, have mercy. You know with what judgmentalness and contempt you have spoken about other people, and you have been the measuring stick for the hatred and the devaluing of them. And Holy Scripture itself holds up the mirror and says, so be it. As you judge them according to the same measure, you shall also be judged. This neglect of your neighbor is inborn. You can't help it. It's part of your willful self that most days you're mostly concerned about you. And you want to know how things are going to play out with you today and tomorrow and in the near future. We look at others and we covet what they have. And we compare our lot with another's and we start to have these feelings inside as we're making comparisons that something's unfair. That's coveting. And then we accept whatever gain comes our way, believing we lack what we need. We should never look a gift horse in the mouth, we think, when money or goods or something lines up for us and makes us feel secure. We do covet things of this world, and we covet the security that it gives us, even if it's just for a minute, because we lack trust in God to be our provider. Coveting is part of your sin nature. And because of your coveting, you will die. Oh, dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken? Why is this sharp sentence over you spoken? We hear tonight the Christian gospel that we have a Savior who is gracious. And this Savior looks upon those who have broken all the commands, including the ninth and tenth, and he gives us reasons to have hope that we will not die immersed in our sin. First, he gives us a reason to appreciate the justification that he makes for us. Jesus is in no way boasting. He's just making it clear that all of us are creatures of sin and that he, absent of sin, is capable of being our Savior. So without boasting, but rather in humility as the Lamb of God, he says, I am yours, and calls us to look to him for favor. The second thing he does is he calls us to trust that our own needs are going to be provided for. And he actually sends us in his name out to others 
with that same message that their needs are provided for too by trust in God the Father. He wants us to look other people in the eye and to be grateful for their presence. He wants us to engage with strangers and to give them grace in the moment because we are Jesus' disciples in the present day. We do good works, especially to those who are in the family of believers and especially to those who are strangers to Christ, not so that we can add more merit or credibility to our own ledger, thinking that God surely will see that I have been one of the good ones. The whole reason we do good works is for the sake of our neighbor who needs the same kind of grace that Jesus has shown to us. Christ has loved you even as a mess up. And so we're to care for other messed up people and we're not to harbor ill will for them, but we're to learn to see them as people whom God created and loves. You were very much like a tin can and our Savior Jesus was very much like a collector who walks by with a stick and pokes through it and then looks at this tin can, says, this is worth redeeming. And then burnishing, cleaning, making it suitable so that it's not trash, but rather valued in the sight of the collector who obtained it. So, we are to go out into the world and no matter whom we see and what our initial reaction, instead of kicking them with our verbal sparring and our feelings that we tell other people with our crude comments, not kicking the can, but rather seeing that person as a fellow human being, speaking caring to them, so that in the moment, they might feel that they are worth redeeming as well. And you will have given the same love toward them, the stranger, that has been shown toward you. Why, Lord Jesus, do you hang there derelict and still? Why is it in proportion that you have to bear our sin? And that we can't be justified even partly by being decent people? You have to do this. Because you value the world. And you value sinners of every nation and of every stripe of sin. We're sorry, Lord Jesus, for the way we've neglected the needs of others. For the way in private we have carved them up without mercy, with our words and descriptions. We're seeking mercy for the way that we have neglected our neighbor and all the things that make up our life that all we can do is shake our heads and say, I'm ashamed. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us. We do want to see them with the same eyes in which you see them. Have mercy. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now stand and sing.
come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me. You come into your kingdom. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Lord, have mercy. We have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. You have shown us mercy, patience, and generosity. We ask your forgiveness for neglecting to see all that we have has been a gracious gift from you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have sinned against our neighbors by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have provided for ourselves, and too often we have not shown generosity, compassion, or care for others. We ask your forgiveness for neglecting to serve those living in despair, fear, and helplessness. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty Father, your Son paid the just cost for transgressions we have committed. In his death on the cross, shedding his blood for our sake, he has atoned for all that we have done wrong against you and others. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. to you, come to me quickly, hear my voice when I cry to you.
Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evil doers. But my eyes are turned to you, O God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you, incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Guide us waking, Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you.
I have no announcements. Do you? Does anyone else have announcements? We've come seeking mercy, and we always find it in Jesus. 